Straight ahead on Law and Crime Daily. Grand jurors speak in the case involving the police shooting of Breonna Taylor. Should all of the officers have been charged? Was the case properly handled? Turn yourself in, kill yourself, or do what you need to do. A news anchor leaves a threatening message for a mayor, which lands her under arrest and the mayor out of office. Prosecutors and defense attorneys face off in a Zoom hearing as the case of the accused Parkland shooter moves forward. The judge weighs in. I think my hands are tied when it comes to your request. Law & Crime Daily covers court cases from coast to coast. And welcome everybody to Law & Crime Daily. I'm Aaron Keller along with Brian Buckmeyer and Terry Austin. Grand jurors are speaking out in the police shooting death of Breonna Taylor. They're doing so after a court ruled they could finally speak freely, not cloaked by the secrecy normally afforded to grand jury proceedings. Kentucky Attorney General Daniel Cameron said the officers who shot and killed Breonna Taylor could not be charged under Kentucky law because their actions were self-defense. The officers were executing a no-knock warrant, of course. Taylor's boyfriend grabbed his gun and fired. The plainclothes officers fired back, shooting and killing Brianna. Her killing sparked protests and calls for reform, especially considering the police were really after Brianna Taylor's ex-boyfriend. In the ruling that the jurors could speak, a judge said Kentucky law and the U.S. Constitution do not require complete secrecy surrounding grand jury materials. This is a rare and extraordinary example of a case where the historical reasons for preserving grand jury secrecy are null, the judge wrote. Those reasons include because Officer Brett Hankinson has already been indicted and there's little risk of witness tampering, the judge said. Immediately after the jurors were allowed to speak, they spoke. Law and Crimes' Brian Buckmeyer is here now with some of their statements. Brian? Right. Aaron, so under Kentucky law, a grand jury must be called to serve at least once every four months. But its members cannot be called to meet more than 20 days. One person on the grand jury said the Breonna Taylor case was unlike all others. In a statement, grand juror number one took aim at the attorney general, saying, After hearing the attorney general Daniel Cameron's press conference, and with my duty as a grand juror being over, my duty as a citizen compelled action. The grand jury was not presented any charges other than the three wanton endangerment charges against Detective Hankinson. The grand jury did not have homicide offenses explained to them. The grand jury never heard anything about those law. Self-defense or justification was never explained either. Questions were asked about additional charges and the grand jury was told there would be none because the prosecutors didn't feel they can make them stick. The grand jury didn't agree that certain actions were justified, nor did it decide the indictment should be the only charges in the Breonna Taylor case. The grand jury was not given the opportunity to deliberate on those charges. Thanks a lot, Brian. That statement comes as one of the officers involved in the botch raid on Breonna Taylor's apartment is also speaking out. Here to tell us about that side of the story is Law and Crime Daily's Terry Austin. Terry? Yeah, Sergeant Jonathan Mattingly sat down for an interview with ABC News and Louisville's Courier Journal newspaper. Mattingly says he remembers officers announcing themselves at least three times. Mattingly was one of the three officers who opened fire. He was wounded by a gunshot to his leg. Police say there's no body cam of the incident, but a responding officer's body cam captured the chaotic moments as Mattingly collapsed to the ground outside Taylor's apartment. Here's Mattingly's response when asked about nationwide protests. It's not a race thing like people want to try to make it to be. This is a point where we were doing our job. We gave too much time. When we go in, I get shot. We return fire. This is not us going hunting somebody down. This is not kneeling on a neck. This is nothing like that. And I know I'm, I'm not going to sit here and act like playing the big victim card. But I, I mean, I was a victim in this as well. My family has been a victim in this. They have had to go in hiding. They have had death threats. When somebody sits back from their mansion and accuses somebody they don't know of being a racist and, and being a dirty cop, being a murderer, when that's not the case, that, that does affect you. You were called racist. Mm -hmm. Are you racist? No, not at all. Appreciate the updates there, Terry, Brian, and joining us especially right now is former prosecutor Bernarda Villalona. So, Bernarda, glad to have you on the Law & Crime Daily broadcast as usual. The grand juror, if we can go back to that a little bit, is really throwing the attorney general under the bus here. Do you think the prosecutors who handled this case before the grand jury made a big mistake or should it just be allowed to go on this way? 
Thank you for having me, Aaron. Aaron, the reality is, is that there was a huge miscarriage of justice in this case. Your role as a prosecutor is to pursue justice, not merely conviction. In this case, a prosecutor has the obligation of candor and good faith. That was not done here in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. That did not take place. Attorney General Cameron did this to himself. And with that, he really put a detriment to the criminal justice system, because now the people of Kentucky and also the people that are watching all around the country have now lost faith in the criminal justice system. They have lost faith in the prosecutors to try to trust and believe that what are they doing is the right thing. And unfortunately, this is going to have devastating effects all around the country because of the missteps and the mishaps of Daniel Cameron in this case. You know, maybe they also gained faith in the judge who allowed these grand jurors to release the information because now we have actual facts we can sit here and discuss. Terry, I want to move to you now. It's interesting that these jurors were allowed to talk considering prosecutors in Kentucky pointed to the police shooting of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, and there the grand jurors were not allowed to talk. What's your assessment of the opposite outcomes as far as letting the grand jurors speak? You know, I think those are two different cases. You might remember that the Michael Brown case was the case where protesters were saying, hands up, don't shoot, because he was running away, then he turned around. But the grand jury there was given a ton of evidence. It was extensive, and the prosecutor was really forthright in front of the grand jury. The other difference, I think, here is that the Department of Justice itself Itself investigated, and they also came to the conclusion that no charges should have been brought here and that police officer was cleared. So it's a difference in the way, as Bernardo was saying, the evidence was presented. Here, everything was there, not as much. It's a great explanation. So, Brian, what's your reaction to the Mattingly interview there? Yeah, it's interesting. I'm not sure if I, as a defense attorney, would have had the officer come forward. Uh, but again, it's a lot of softball questions. Are you racist? No, I don't think he's racist. I, I agree with him. And to some degree, he is a victim. I have more issues with the process rather than the individual who's being prosecuted here, because the process obviously seems to be lacking for black women in this country. So the process, for instance, of how they execute these no-knock warrants. The execution of the no-knock warrant, the investigation into the case, the work of Attorney General uh, Daniel Cameron, that's my issue, not really Hankinson in this case. This has been a great discussion, but we have to move on now because still ahead on Law and Crime Daily, we'll take a look at how actor Bill Cosby looks behind bars as he prepares to appeal his sex crimes case. Also, the police shooting of Jacob Blake set off protests in Kenosha, Wisconsin. But a criminal trial against Blake on a different set of accusations is moving forward. We'll break down the case right after this. A new prison mugshot of Bill Cosby has his fans and friends concerned. Take a look. Cosby is smiling but looks disheveled with messy hair in the prison photo. The 83-year-old comedian is serving time for felony sex assault. Cosby's publicist released a different photo taken during a virtual visit to assure his fans that he's doing okay during the pandemic. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court has agreed to review two issues in Cosby's case. The man at the center of protests against law enforcement in Wisconsin appeared remotely for a court hearing. Jacob Blake was shot seven times by a Kenosha police officer. Officers were responding to a call from a woman saying her boyfriend was at her home and that he wasn't supposed to be there. Blake is recovering from his injuries at a rehab facility in Illinois. He's pleaded not guilty to charges of third-degree sexual assault, criminal trespass, and disorderly conduct. He appeared in court via Zoom for a pretrial hearing. There also was a state's motion for admission of uh, other acts uh, which they claim uh, are attributed to the defendant involving uh, other acts of uh, violent attacks on uh, the complaining witness in the case on other occasions. Um, what's the status of the case right now? Judge, at this point, the case is unresolved. Uh, from the defense perspective, we had received that motion yesterday. So I'm asking the court to allow me about a week to respond in writing. We have had some discussions about potential resolution, but we don't have a uh, resolution to present to the court. I believe that Mr. Wiedenfeld and I wish to continue those discussions, and uh, we have a joint request for the court to not hold a Ludwig hearing at this point and hold open the possibility of resolution.
Blake's case is scheduled to go to trial on November 9th. The judge is giving both sides the opportunity to resolve it before then. So, Brian, the state filed a so-called other acts motion that they were talking about there. That involves alleged violent acts on the complaining witness or the victim. Explain that process to me, and should these other acts come into this trial? So without knowing exactly what those acts are, I can't really go too deep into it. But the fact that it's against the same complaining witness or victim as you're putting it does give it a strong chance to show that there is either a lack of mistake or that this is uh, the defendant's M.O. And those are really good grounds to bring in previous bad acts or previous bad crimes. So, Bernarda, this case predates the shooting itself, which, of course, made the national headline. So the question is, should anything about the shooting come into this trial? So, Aaron, there's so much that we don't know about this case and also about the shooting itself, where Mr. Blake was shot seven times in the back. So, not knowing that it'll be difficult to tell because, one, the county has been very tight-knit as to what information they're going to release to the public. So, my only concern, I guess, at this point is to make sure that whoever is prosecuting Mr. Jacob Blake, and I believe it is the Kenosha County District Attorney's Office, has to have a different prosecutor or a different prosecutor's office to do the investigating investigation into the shooting of Jacob Blake. So there is no conflict that exists or appearance of a conflict. Yeah, and that appearance is the key word, because even if there is no true one, there's always the possible appearance, and that's why we try to keep these things separate. Terry, the trial in this case is coming up on November 9th. It's only a couple of weeks away. There were additional rallies and uh, protests, one might say, uh, surrounding the shooting. Uh, so, so this is really in the news locally. How do they see the jury? I think that what is going to happen here is we're going to see a resolution of the charges against Jacob Blake because the fact that he was shot seven times in the back, I don't think that anyone wants to bring this domestic assault case against him because clearly there was excessive force used against him. So I think we might see a resolution of those charges before we see a resolution of the charges against the police officer. It's highly possible, and of course, we saw the judge trying to spur that on in that little hearing. So many nuggets in these pretrial hearings that tip the hat to what's going to happen in the trial. And still to come on our broadcast here on Law & Crime Daily, the alleged Parkland High School shooter is back in court, and there's another delay in the case. We'll explain that. Plus, a profanity-laden tirade for an Alaska mayor lands a news anchor in legal trouble. Our analysis of that, vir that viral recording is straight ahead. Allegations of sexting and an anti-Semitic voicemail led the mayor of Anchorage, Alaska to resign, and the saga ends with the arrest of a TV news anchor. Mayor Ethan Berkowitz resigned last week after admitting to sexting with anchor Maria Athens. Athens posted a photo of what appeared to be Berkowitz naked to her Facebook page and accused him of sex crimes. Here's the profane voicemail the news anchor left for the mayor, and we've had to beep out a lot of swearing. From Fox ABC CW News at National Alaska. Uh, I just learned through my uh, I, uh, Emmy Award winning journalism, you are also a pedophile in like little girls and children. And there's a website. I'm so exposing you. I'm going to get an Emmy. So you either turn yourself in, kill yourself, or do what you need to do. I will personally kill you and Mara Kimmel, my self, you piece of living. You have met your match, mother You have met your mother match. I can't believe I am such a good person and thought I loved you. I hate, I don't even hate you. I will pray for your You piece of loser. And I'm putting this on the news tonight. Bye. Have a great Friday, you mother Wow. Police charge Maria Athens, whose voice you heard there, with assault, criminal mischief, and disorderly conduct after she attacked her boss, identified who is also her boyfriend. Police say she also attacked an officer when they tried to arrest her. Okay, Terry Austin, what do you think? 
I think I have not heard a string of words like that put together in a long time, and I hope she doesn't eat with that dirty mouth. I think these charges are not going to go away. I think it's going to go to trial because her threats were of a very serious nature, and if the jury hears even part of that tape, I think they're going to hold her accountable for her horrible words. Yeah, I mean, this doesn't look good to a jury. Brian, um, w w when you say, I will personally kill you, and you leave it in a recorded message, w what's the defense? I have to ask, what's the defense? You're the defense attorney. What is it? Can I get a plea? Um, <laughs> you don't want the trial. <laughs> Ta Terry wants the trial. You want the plea. Can I get a what plea? is it? Um, so this is hard because under any interpretation of a threat, it's a true threat. It's immediate. It's not conditional. Uh, the only thing I would say is that at the end of the day, it is a fairly low-level crime. This is something that I think, at least in New York and pro possibly in Alaska, that you don't typically see go to trial. It's something that's negotiated out the thing. Hey, she needs anger management. She needs counseling. She needs something. Let's not put her in jail. I think that's the argument here. Yeah, Terry, I don't think you'd be offering that plea agreement. You want to see the trial. I do want to see the trial because you can't just go around saying I'm going to kill you. She should know better. She's a reporter and she's been on television. She should not leave messages like that. I think it's horrible. Uh, taking the words right out of many of our mouths, Terry Austin, Brian Buckmeyer. Well, when we come back, the case of the accused Parkland school shooter. Arguments are moving very slowly forward for the man accused of killing 17 students at a high school building. An update on yet another delay in the case in just a moment. Let's wrap up now with the case of the accused Parkland school shooter. Defense attorneys for Nicholas Cruz say they're unable to have a psych evaluation of their client because the jail is closed to outside visitors due to COVID-19 precautions. Cruz is facing the possible death penalty if convicted of murdering 17 people at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. His attorneys say an evaluation via Zoom is just not sufficient. Court records show more than 1,000 people are on the witness list, potentially to be called at trial. The defense is asking for a good faith witness list to try to narrow down that number, a request the state is objecting to. Your Honor, that is uh, ridiculous. The law doesn't call for that. We list the A witnesses and the C witnesses. They've even requested of us to take deposition of the C witnesses. We agreed. Uh, they have provided 139 witnesses themselves. Uh, we don't know who they're going to call. Our, our obligation is to provide information uh, as the witnesses who know something about the case. And that's what we have done. As they even point out in their request, there is no law demanding that we do that. And we're being as thorough as we can. We don't know who they're going to call. They haven't even provided us, uh, you know, who their uh, defense is going to be, if they're going to rely on mental health. We're just sitting and waiting. Cruz is represented by a team of public defenders. They voiced their concerns multiple times about the magnitude of work preparing for what's expected to be an extremely high-profile trial. State has announced ready for trial uh, many, many times. I mean, I don't and I'm not, we're not suggesting that there's a law that requires them to provide us a good faith witness list. What we're asking for in order to speed our preparation and prevent us from wasting hours and hours of our time, as we did already, uh, we're just asking that they tell us. We've given them a list of 139 witnesses, as Mr. Sapp said. They've given us list, a list of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of witnesses. And if what they're saying is they're intending to call every one of them, so be it. Then we need to prepare for every single one of those witnesses and any motion that goes with it. But if they want us to speed our preparation, they can help us in this way. Cruz's trial is now delayed indefinitely. The judge is asking both sides to try to work together in the meantime. I agree with Mr. Sachs. There's no law that says I have to require them to do that. Even at the time of trial, I can't require them to do that. Uh, I can say, call your next witness, but I, I can't order the state to tell what witnesses they're calling and, and, and so on and so forth. So my suggestion would be reach out, try to get some kind of stipulation, let them know that the, the, what you're relying on um, and so on and so forth. And maybe a stipulation can be done before you have to do all that work. But that, that's, that's a suggestion. Obviously, it's not an order. 
Terry, I gotta ask about this, this issue about witness lists. I see this being done differently in almost every single state. In some state, the rules of procedure basically require each side to hand over witness lists. It's done orderly so that each side can prepare and not be blindsided. And then in other states, it basically turns into a game of blindsiding the other side with who's gonna get called. It just doesn't seem fair to do it the second way. It seems fair that the procedure would be set out. Or, or, or do I just have this all wrong? No, you have it all right, Aaron. I think that both sides should be fair and reasonable. They should give their witness list, especially the prosecution. They have to give, and the motion said, a more realistic witness list because the defense does have to you know, prepare for the case. And as horrendous as this trial was, as this case was back in 2018, you know, Cruz does deserve a defense, and the defense has to prepare. So I think asking for a realistic list makes sense so they can prepare whatever motions and they can defend the case. So I, I do agree with the defense here. What I want to see is a focus on process and due process, fair process, and not just on punishment. Even in heinous cases like this, Brian, if you got deluged with a thousand names on a witness list, how would you even react to it? I would laugh. I, I, I would say, all right, fine. I have a thousand names. Now I need to speak to each one of them. I need to do deposition for each one of them. It's COVID right now. And I would highlight the absurdity of what these prosecutors are doing, similarly to how the defense is doing it here. They're probably doing it a little bit nicer than I would, but it's absurd. There should be a better list. That sounds like a great tactic, and those depositions are possible in Florida. We'll see you next time right here on Law and Crime Daily to discuss justice in America. Hi, I'm Dan Abrams. In the exploding legal and true crime genre, Law & Crime is the only network that has it all. Good evening and welcome. This is a complicated case. Don't really jump to conclusions. We break down the case of a serial killer. Another day of drama between both sides. From multiple live trials daily to original and compelling programming, the Law & Crime Network is everywhere. And we invite you inside the jury box. This is Law & Crime.